Dan, I'm on the budget committee. I can only okay. speak for myself. Speak I can't oh. speak for anybody else on the budget committee. Um, back in 2011, we had the taxpayer revolt. That's what I call it. And it was decided that uh, we were going to reduce our staff. I don't really trust town-wide referendums. I don't even trust the majority of voters because that's not the majority of the town voting. It's just the majority of the people who do vote. Um, that's the way I look at it. That's why I voted no on it. Uh, that explains it. Eddie Moore, I am on the budget committee. And I did have a fire on a Saturday night, which was during the volunteer fire, fire time. And I was very happy with the services I received. I think we should leave them the way they are. Thank you. He's also on the committee. Yes, we have also on the budget committee. I would ask the administration to check with the chairman. I'm not sure that was our vote. And I'm really sure that was not our vote on Article 13. Rudy Jowson, I'm also a member of the budget committee. And uh, I agree that uh, the fire station not just the show out of Saturday, it is, uh, you know, 18 hours, uh, additional hours for a week. But I personally believe that if people need time, you should not be service that the fire people do for all of us, especially, you know, in this particular time, you know, in winter time. I believe that, uh, you know, the, the money is well spent and about the years <coughs> Anyone else have a question or a comment? I'm Regina Bowler. I'm a registered voter and I'm married to a firefighter. Um, I will say I personally feel great distress when I leave um, alone the pager when it opens up and I hear repeated calls for the call company between 1 p.m. on Saturday afternoon and 7 a.m. on Monday morning because it is my neighbors and fellow residents who are waiting for firefighters to respond and there is no one at the fire station answering that call until the second or third page sentence. Thank you. I wanted to make one other comment if I could. Ron, did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, one your favorite. Okay. I, I spent part of the summer um, looking at all 29 contracts that are posted on the New Hampshire government site on this issue because I had been told, and, and I thought it was true as well, uh, that there was a state law, a state RSA that said that the work week for firemen should be 53 hours. And uh, when I was at the Selectman's Institute where we were learning the laws, uh, the uh, fire chief from Laconia who became the the trainer, uh, the head of training for the state of New Hampshire told me that uh, there is um, there is no such law. Uh, so I went through all 29 contracts and what I found out is that there are two towns, no, there are 27 towns who are at 42 hours, just like our fire department. There are two towns at 48 hours, what we're proposing to go to. And that's basically um, the distribution. There is no state law. There is a federal regulation, and it's called a standard. It's not a law. Uh, it's under the uh, Code of Federal Regulations uh, for fire protection employees. And I have to tell you, um, reading how firemen are scheduled in these contracts is one of the most difficult paragraphs you could ever read because they counted either on a 28-day basis or on a 14-day basis, and it becomes very complicated from an arithmetic standpoint to follow it. But everyone's at 42 hours. We're proposing to go to 48 to address the issue that was just spoken to, which is manning the fire station for more hours. 
and there is no state requirement but there are two towns that are at 48 hours and uh, the rest are at 42. Go ahead. Joe Mercieri, Fire Chief. I'd like to speak to this article um, and some of the comments made. Um, basically, this article is going to allow us to uh, staff the fire station um, for additional 18 hours. It was going to reduce the number of hours that the fire station remains on staff from 42 hours on a weekend to 24 hours um, on a weekend, primarily that being a Sunday. Basically, um, the call company, Littleton's call company, is probably one of the busiest call companies in the state. Uh, last year, they logged over 2,300 hours of response for the community. Uh, that's an incredible amount of hours for a call company. You gotta understand what a call company is. A call company is primarily um, supplemental to the, to the department. But we've tossed them into a whole different role in the last two years. We've asked them to be primary responders on weekends. Not only have we asked them to be primary responders, but we also asked them to work shifts in order to reduce overtime, which has been very successful. Um, some of the things that you have to realize is call company members are regular working people. They work 40 hour, 50 hour a week jobs. They also provide a service to our community. And from what I see happening and from what I can tell, um, they do do a good job providing a service for us. They do an exceptional job. However, you know, there's also that burnout rate. I would prefer to see us increase some of the weekend coverage to take the burden off the call company and give them some of a break on a weekend. You gotta understand that the only break these guys get after they leave Friday from the regular jobs is a short period of time on Saturday till one o'clock and then they're it, they're on duty and they have to respond, right? That's a place a big burden on their time and their other commitments, right? Um, gotta also gotta understand now, I looked it up today to determine just how much of a percentage of weekend calls is a call company covering, right? Statistically, our call company is currently covering 40% of the weekend calls, which is an extraordinary amount of calls, right? Um, basically, if you want to know how many calls we average on a Saturday and a Sunday, uh, Saturday year, this is 2013 statistics of total for Saturdays, we average 115 calls. For Sunday, we average 86 calls. Now that's been pretty much the standard for the last four or five years. So it's not one day is any busier than the other. We're busy every day of the week. Uh, I like to see this article supported. I like to see this article pass. Um, to, for me, uh, it would provide us with 24-hour um, coverage on Saturday. It would reduce some of the impact on the call company. It doesn't eliminate the call company from responding. It doesn't eliminate the call company from working uh, uh, shifts. What it merely does is just gives them a break on the weekend, which is something I think we need badly. Thank you. How do our communities around us respond? Uh, Bethlehem all call? I can't answer that for some not sure. How about Lisbon? How about Sugar Hill? Well they're all they're all how about Lisbon? Lisbon? How about yeah. Whitefield? They're all home. how about Lancaster? Right. How about Dalton? Every single one of those communities are call fire people out of those things. And it used to be that they had private call companies. In fact is Littleton had one too. It was called Eureka Host Company. It was a privately funded fire department out of thing. I, I've just appalled that maybe it's our town. We have got a large hospital, you've got everything like this on it, but consequently, these people have got rural areas, they still have towns, they have some have big hotels, they have a lot of other things that they respond to and everything on it. And I, and, I, and I think that we're jumping into stuff 
that we're supported through our contracts that we have with these other towns to support us as well. Um, I, I look at every fire we have, and I think that Lisbon and Whitefield and some of these other com towns are here before we get to the fire. But uh, I'd like to think that this is not necessarily the best thing. One more time. Not all those towns have $750 million worth of property to protect. Um, and, and not to uh, you know beat a dead horse, uh, but I did one other calculation. And the Budget Committee supported 21 money articles this year, totaling $2.2 million. And they're not supporting an article that's going to give us $900 of fire protection on the weekend for $9. To me, that's illogical. Yeah, and if you could please check the numbers before the ballots are printed. Thank you. My name is Dan. I wanted to ask Joe a question, and that is, uh, do you still respond with a call out on locked out of vehicle calls? Uh, we don't respond to out. Excellent. Barbara Stone, I'm a resident, and I would uh, really uh, urge people to support this. I was uh, one of the first things um, that brought me to a select committee meeting was when uh, when the town first um, eliminated those positions. I think that was a big mistake. Uh, I, I really am uncomfortable on the weekends knowing that there's no one in the firehouse. Fires happen at any time. I think the town is being very incautious. Uh, in not um, maintaining its fire department the way the way it was and the way we were doing well with it, um, I don't haven't heard any research or any any evidence to support why or how a voluntary fire department would be uh, better. And uh, I think it's very important for us to get get the fire department back up to speed the way it was. I wish that we were able to vote on uh, getting those uh, two firemen who had to be eliminated uh, to come back. So I support this. I'm Karen. And I worked very closely with the uh, fire department employee that worked on these numbers with, with me. And we reviewed at least 12 different schedules trying to come up with the most reasonable, cost-effective way to add hours without burning out our full-time firefighters. Um, and if we had looked at adding two more firefighters, that number was well above $160,000. So by adding 18 hours, you're getting the biggest amount of time we can provide you at a reasonable cost. Okay. Any other questions? Are you ready for the question? Okay. And it's um, Article 9. All those in favor of placing that uh, article on the ballot from March 11th, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. We're moving on to Article 10. You have that one? Life, disability, and income protection insurance benefits for call and part-time firefighters. Article 10. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $8,000 for the purpose of providing life and disability and lost wages insurance coverage to the call or part-time firefighters. This appropriation will encompass life insurance, disability, and loss wages benefits only. If this article passes, benefits will automatically be included in, the f in future budgets. The tax impact is a penny, recommended by the selectmen three to zero, recommended by the budget committee eight to zero. I would say that one of the budget committee members did later, the, 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 the official vote is eight to zero, but he did uh, want to change his vote, so on, um, uh, on, a, on a second call, it would be seven to one. But the budget committee overall felt that, that this was a, uh, a good uh, article, obviously. 
I make a motion that we place this on the floor for discussion. I need a second. Second. Okay. Thank you. Favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The rationale here um, is partly um, a retention and a recruitment issue. Um, we have 24 call company and part-time employees currently in our in our uh, call company uh, group. And again, going back to the Laconia fire chief, uh, she told me that they only have 12. And Laconia is a much larger community than Littleton. And she was moving from Laconia to the, to the state position, as I mentioned before. But she was sort of surprised that a, a community of our size had as many as 24. And some of you may remember about a year and a half or two years ago, the New York, uh, New York Times, the uh, uh, Manchester Union leader ran an article on how difficult it is to find call company personnel for some of the very reasons that the fire chief spoke to. These people work 40 hours a week or 50 hours a week elsewhere. They are backup and supportive uh, to our firefighters. So we thought that if they get hurt on the job, a workman's comp will pay them 60 some percent of their wages. This insurance would cover the other 40 percent if they were out for some period of time. Um, and the, um, the other issue here, again, is um, the tax impact is only a penny and it's a, a, a retention issue for us and a recruitment issue because it's hard to find people to fill these positions when they vacate. Are there any questions or, or uh, comments or discussion? Dan. Yes, my name is Dan. I'm the budget committee member who changed his vote on that. Uh, I called the New Hampshire Department of Insurance and asked them if um, homeowners insurance would cover this. Uh, if a firefighter went out, he was injured on the job, if their insurance company uh, would cover that. And they said, no, not at this time. <coughs> and um, of course, I wouldn't want anybody to go out on a job, get hurt, and, uh, and have their family have to bear the responsibility. So my suggestion would be that they just don't go out on these kinds of jobs. Uh, with the way it should be handled is that the fire, the, the homeowner should have insurance with his, his insurance company that would cover this situation. The taxpayers shouldn't have to do this. Uh, Bruce Hadlock, I, I asked at the last meeting, because it, it was brought up and you never mentioned workman's compensation. And I actually went back to the fire chief and asked him and his comments were, it, 60%, but the 60% is the same thing for the full-time fine. It's the same thing if you were working at the stamp company. It's the same thing if you were working anywhere. It's the state law that you get 60%. So it isn't something that is relevantly different, other than the fire chief told me it was going to be 60% of the man who worked, I'll use an example of the stamp company. If he worked at the stamp company, and he was getting those wages. The fire chief informed me that he was going to get 60% of the wages that he would ordinarily earn, not just as a volunteer fine. Now, now the other one was that the federal government had just recently passed a law on it that, that pays the life insurance part of it to anyone that is considered to be a first responder. And that is an automatic thing in the event of a death on it that, that they pay for it as well. And I watched a lot of companies around here, such as UPS. UPS, in turn, has self-funded. The, the employees put in a few dollars of their own money every week on it. And a lot of companies do this. One of the firemen told me he was in the union, and they did the same thing on it. They take a few dollars of their own money, self-insure their own self, to pay. Because if we're paying for them, they got hurt on a fire. If the person was working at a stamp company, he's not going to be getting the extra part of it over here or anywhere else. I shouldn't be using a stamp company. But if you're working any place out of the thing on it, you're not going to get paid extra 
on it for where you're working on the outside. So to think that today should be getting something extra beyond just because they're on a volunteer basis, those people, yes, I, I think it's great that we got 20 people and I think they do a great job, but I'm still not convinced that some of the benefits that we have, we're going overboard on some of these things on it to be able to do these things. On. These people are, they're taking it on, yes, because they like to be firemen, they take it on as an extra job. If they were working as a carpenter on a roof, they could fall off the roof, they're not going to get this type of a thing. So I, I just believe the fact that we're doing a good job, we're paying our people well, and you keep adding and adding and adding, and I just, I, I, I'm just not a believer of it. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? Joe Ruscieri, Fire Chief. Um, I certainly would hate to see one of my call firefighters injured in the line of duty, only to have to realize after the fact that that injury is costing his family 40% of his income. Um, we don't really think, think it through. Uh, that's the reality of it. I mean, basically, when you're recruiting people, you're trying to retain people. Um, I don't want the message to say, Come work for us, but don't get hurt, because if you get hurt, be prepared to lose 40% of your income. Right? That's not the message I, I want to send. I don't think that's the message that the community wants to send. These people take their own time, yes, their own wheel, they go out and they become call firefighters because they want to help the community. I agree with that, 100%. It's the other part that we don't look at. What happens once they're injured? I know for a fact that all of us in this room cannot afford a 40% cut in our wages. Think about that. You're injured tomorrow, you lose 40%. Now, this policy is not going to make them 100% whole. I can tell you that for a fact. Right? It's not going to say, here's your 40%, but it is going to help them recoup a portion of that 40%, which I believe is something that we should support. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready for the question? Okay. The question is, um, shall we place Article 10 on the ballot for March 11th? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no? No. Okay. All right. Moving on to, it's a vote in the affirmative. Moving on to Article 11. Article 11 and Article 12 um, have some extra information that go along with them. And just as a point of, of uh, order, Gerald, can, can we oh, have two of them open at the same time? Why don't, you, why don't you explain the similarities and we'll let the people decide. Both of these articles have to do with, um, with improvements, making improvements to the River District. So the area that includes Saranac Street, Amanusik Street, Green Street, uh, and Mill Street. Okay, so you'd like to link them in the discussion. Well, they're linked. One of them gives, one of them is to give the Board of Selectmen the, the authority to swap, sell, trade land in order to do some of the things that we want to do down there. And then the other one raises some money specifically for some projects down there. Uh, and there's going to be a presentation, a short presentation given that's going to address uh, the project overall, but it is information that I think people are going to want to have okay. in considering gotcha. both of these. Now I, now I gotcha. Okay. So, um, let me just test this. It seems to make sense to link or discuss Article 12, at least somewhat, to further explain Article 11, and probably Article 11 answers some questions in Article 12. So the permission would be from you to discuss both. We'd have to take action on each one at the end of the uh, discussion. Okay, second? Second. Favor, all say aye. Aye. Those no? No. Okay, so you have clearance to go. <laughs> Dan, you sure are contrary. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read both of them. I'm going to, um, I'll start with the first one. 
move to put it on the floor and get a second and then I'll read the second one and then we'll do the presentation. Okay, so Article 11 is to acquire land or rights of ways, buildings or both, or sell, swap, and or trade land to develop and design the River District area around Mill Street, Saranac Street, Bridge Street, and Amanusik Street. Article 11 reads, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $30,000 for the purpose of designing and planning changes to the River D District roads, Mill Street, Saranac Street, Bridge Street, and Amanusik Street, and infrastructure, and infrastructure, and to acquire land and or right of ways or buildings without further vote of the town for that purpose, and to authorize the selectmen to expend such funds for that purpose only after consultation with the Conservation Commission and the Planning Board and two public hearings held pursuant to the procedures set forth in RSA 41-14A. Furthermore, to authorize the selectmen to apply for, accept, and expend grants or other funds that are available for such purpose. The tax impact is 0.039 cents, so 3.9 cents, recommended by the selectmen, three to zero, recommended by the budget committee, five to two. So I'm going to move that we put that one on the, that we put that one on the floor. Second. Milt seconded it. So that one's open, and then I'm gonna read the next one. Uh, River District Revitalization, Designing, Preliminary Engineering, and Final Report. Article 12 reads, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $50,000 for the purpose of designing, planning, and developing the River District area, Mill Street, Saranac Street, Bridge Street, and Amanusik Street, and further to authorize the withdrawal of $19,000 from the undesignated, unreserved fund balance for that purpose. This amount represents the balance left from the Riverwalk Phase Two project. The remaining $31,000 is to come from taxation. Furthermore, to authorize the selectmen to apply for, accept, and expend grants or other funds that are available for such purpose. The tax impact would be 4.1 cent, recommended by the selectmen three to zero, recommended by the budget committee five to two. Now instead of opening that one, I'm just going to leave it hanging out there the way it is, and I'm going to ask John Hennessy if he would please come up here. John. Hennessy has been working with the uh, committee that we put together, the commission that we put together to work on this um, on this project. And he has a, a brief presentation to make, uh, and then we'll have a, a chance for questions, and presumably voting. Thanks. Thanks, the commission's actually done a series of in-depth presentations on this project over the past couple of months, so I'll keep my comments tonight brief and just to the most critical. <clears throat> Excuse me. This project started a year and a half ago when the town decided that it needed a plan to address some infrastructure issues along the river corridor, uh, along Saranac, Amnusic Mill Street, from Bridge Street, uh, where Corey Sports Shop is, all the way over to Cottage Street. And uh, so the town brought in a group of professional planners and engineers and uh, held a weekend long series of community input sessions. Based on that input from the community, uh, this, this group of professionals developed a comprehensive vision and plan for this district. Uh, a couple major conclusions they made is, one, is that our community has this beautiful river going right through the heart of our downtown that we really should be enjoying and using to our biggest advantage here. And another is that we have a very strong Main Street, which they were all impressed with, and, and determined that we really should link the river with Main Street to make the Main Street and downtown corridor even stronger than it is today. Uh, I've got a couple slides that show the plan that uh, this group came up with. Uh, this, is, this is obviously a real high level overview that shows the linkages between Main Street and the river, provides some gateways that draw the two together, provides some river vistas, uh, and some critical areas for redevelopment. Uh, the next slide goes in a little more detail, shows some of the key components that they looked at. One, namely, is parking, which has always been a struggle for the downtown businesses and the downtown in general, uh, as well as the river walk that was considered, uh, the roadway, uh, and importantly, safety and walkability along the roadway, uh, as well as some, some green space and some greenery to make the uh, area nice. Uh, so the town then named a 12-person commission to take this plan and to execute it. Uh, two of the people on that commission are Fred Moody and Margie Seymour. 
uh, as well as we have uh, professional engineers to help us with the project as well. Uh, we had two primary goals that we're continuing with today. Uh, the first is to fix some broken infrastructure both below ground and above ground along this corridor. It's the oldest infrastructure below ground in the town of Littleton. And two, to create uh, some economic development opportunities that will bring revenue to the town and positively impact the tax base in the future. Regarding the infrastructure, the town in the past year spent $30,000 in the Mill Street area to address some stormwater and sewer drainage emergencies. And in the past 10 years, it spent an additional $28,000 on sewer emergencies in the Saranac Street area, all of which have been 100% paid for by the taxpayers of the town. Above ground, two areas uh, to use as examples of needed improvement. If you look at behind Bank of New Hampshire building and the town offices, we've got 1,000 vehicles per day driving through that area. Uh, we've got four roadways intersecting in the same spot, and there's no walkways going through that area at all. It provides for a very dangerous and congested area. Uh, the roadway doesn't run straight through there. It runs into a parking lot, has to jog around it, and then continue back with the roadway to, to continue on parallel to the river. Uh, the other area of focus would be the intersection of Meadow Street and Saranac, heavily trafficked. The roadway is about wide enough to handle a car and a half. So if two cars meet there, which they often do, one of the vehicles often has to drive on the private property that's there at the intersection. The plan would address that, uh, create a safer uh, intersection there. As far as economic development goes, the town has a history of success with projects much like this one. Uh, the first one I'd point to is the industrial park, LIDC. Uh, invested a million dollars into the industrial park, got three million dollars of matching funds, and over the, uh, the course of time since that investment was made has brought in nine million dollars of tax revenue for the town to offset uh, taxpayer expenditures. The other being Main Street, which has been very successful as well. The, the reason that it's in such good shape today is all the investments that uh, have been done over the past couple decades to bring it to the point where it is. And the river has a very good potential as well to have successes uh, in the same light. So we got the Warren articles combined with the funding that will be applied from the reserves would be somewhere between thirty-one and $61,000 depending on how much is needed in negotiating these rights away. To put that in perspective, I'll talk a little bit about the progress that this commission has made to date. Uh, North Country Council has done a comprehensive traffic and parking study in this whole district. Uh, we've got two engineering firms from the town of Littleton, Riverside Engineering and Horizons Engineering, which have has volunteered their time to take all the previous plans that the town has paid for and put together in one comprehensive map, overlay the, uh, some additional work to date that they've done on some of the problem areas to give us a real head start towards finalizing with the Warren article that we're proposing here today. Uh, as far as funding goes, we've attained $30,000 in grant funding already in the six months that we've been focusing on applying for grants and have raised $28,000 of private funding as well, which will go toward uh, a demonstration project uh, related to this overall plan that will start in the spring and summer of this coming year. We've already met with uh, Senator Ayotte and the staff of Senator Shaheen and Representative Custer to get the process moving forward and generate interest in obtaining public funds for the, for the project to match and, and offset some of the town funding. Uh, they've shown great interest in the project. What's most important to them at this point is to see that the town supports the project as well, which will enable the commission to spend the next year r raising as much money as it possibly can to help with this project. Uh, I think this, the town's investment here is a very good one. I think the reason uh, that we can all be so proud of Littleton today is all the projects like this one that we've done over the past 10, 20, and 30 years. And I think this project will help us be proud of Littleton 10 years from now as well. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Select Woman Seymour. Thanks. I just want to briefly uh, talk a little bit about what a project like this looks like from the perspective of a selectman. Um, Littleton has a, has a long history of being very proactive when it comes to economic development. Uh, Littleton also has a history of having individual townspeople work hard on on getting projects, moving projects forward, and, and having the foresight to see that 
a healthy infrastructure and a and healthy um, variety of economic opportunities in a town gives us a, a certain strength that a lot of other communities don't have. Um, I think that part of our economic health that we've been able to see through this, I mean, I, I'm sure that some others of you have driven around the North Country in the past couple of years, and I mean, the, the difference between our Main Street and a lot of the other main streets that we can see is really pretty phenomenal. Um, Littleton, we may be hurting in the in the back corners in some places, but you don't see it when you drive through our town. And uh, I think that I just would like to speak in favor. The, the Board of Selectmen is in favor of both of these articles. Uh, we're in favor because we believe that our economic health uh, depends in, in part on our proactive approach to development. Um, we have a wide variety of different kinds of jobs available in this town so that no one sector, if one sector goes down, um, it doesn't ruin the town's economy overall. We have had foresight in making improvements that have given us our vital and widely celebrated Main Street. Um, we have gotten a lot of help from the taxpayers to do some of the projects that we've done and we hope that, that you will continue to support it. And I also would just like to say that by planning ahead, by knowing that we're going to be making improvements and by, by intending to make improvements to a particular area of town and starting off by making the improvements to the infrastructure in that area, we avoid the need for a lot of emergency sorts of repairs. Just this year, we have made a, somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars worth of emergency repairs on Mill Street because of infrastructure that was that was not up to date and was not able to handle some of the uh, the runoff that we're seeing from the big storms that we're getting in the summertime. So we would like to see some of that. We would like to see all of that infrastructure upgraded so that we don't have to deal with those kinds of. You know, something happens to, on a Thursday, and on Monday we've got somebody in our selectmen's meeting asking us to, you know, do something about about things that are going wrong in their in their front yards. Um, we would like to make sure that those kinds of things are talked about and thought about and planned for ahead of time, instead of all of a sudden needing to be done. So, this project is one of the things that will help us get the get the groundwork laid for some, uh, some some further economic development in the town of Littleton in an area that we believe is going to be really beneficial to the entire town. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, what would be germane? Any questions on Article 11 or 12 before we bring them to a vote? I have a question. I was just reading them both and they sound like the same thing, so I'm confused. Um, is there some important difference between them or why aren't they just one article? Thank you. Article, in, in a lot of ways, Article 11 is sort of a, a housekeeping article. The, there's, a, there's a regulation that in order for the, um, there's a state law that in order for the town uh, government, the selectmen, and the and the town manager to sell property or buy property or trade, um, there has to be a town meeting vote, and so we need to have the vote of this body, this meeting tonight, in order to get it on the ballot, and then the and then the, the March meeting in order to pass it, to give us the opportunity to uh, acquire rights of ways or pieces of property to, to, you know, in order to maybe put a road in a place where it isn't before or to move it from where it is to someplace else. So the first article is to give us that authority um, so that we don't have to wait until next year's town meeting to move ahead with some of the things that we'd like to do. And then the second article, Article 12, is to raise money specifically to do the uh, engineering that needs to be done in order to uh, determine exactly how we're going to go about spending the money, you know, moving forward with this project. Does that make sense, Mary? Um, yeah, I guess I 
I mean, yeah, you just need to have the approval to do that, and the other thing is a separate thing. And we wanted to we wanted to tailor that first one so that it just talks about acquiring property in that area, so that it doesn't so that people don't think, oh, now we're going to go out and you know buy something up on Far Hill or any place else in town. This is just specifically to work on on this project. I just want to vote on them one after the other. One after the other. Okay. After the questions, I'll stay here. Brian Hadlock. Um, first of all, I am in favor of uh, you know, <coughs> fixing up that area. Uh, I think it's anywhere around Littleton, around the riverfront, is beautiful, and I think businesses can thrive around it. My concern is trying to limit as much as possible being passed off to the taxpayers. Um, you're looking at what the state of New York is advertising now. Come here, put in a business, and you don't have to pay taxes for 10 years. Um, no, we're not doing that. I know we're not doing exactly that. But there are bar ways to barter with businesses. Someone could come in and say, listen, we've got a basic infrastructure here. Um, you do this, and maybe the town could say we could abate taxes. Who, who knows? But let, let these commercial properties start start paying for something we look at what's happening in other towns and they're building a Walmart they're building these places and the towns are getting fire trucks and fire departments built um, we really need to start looking at these other options so the taxpayers it doesn't come out of their pocket every single time you know these businesses have a lot more I guess able ways to write things off uh, and other, uh, one other thing I want to say is the town has always done an outstanding job as a whole over the years constructing things. But those who have been asking the questions about, okay, how's it going to be maintained afterwards, that's quite frequently been left out. And that really needs to be brought into where if you're going to add on another 100 parking spaces, who's going to plow it? Who's going to take care of it? Do we need to hire another meter person to help? you know, take care of the meters. Those are the things that we need to include as well. Uh, you know, we, we saw it when we put the last river walk in, which was, it's outstandingly beautiful. It gets used all the time. But when it was finished, they said, who's going to maintain it? It's a recreational item in our highway department who had to end up putting in overtime to take care of it. It was never discussed. So those are just some of the things that I just want to make sure that before it goes too far, you know, that there are other options and details that need to be brought in as well. Good, yeah. Rudy Jelsey. Uh, first of all, you know, I was like uh, to thank you, you know, John, for the nice presentation that I did. My concern is that no <coughs> one talks about what is going to happen in the future. The long-term investi investment that the people really plan they're going to make. Nobody talks about that. And this is very bad. Second one is already the time for this year and the year coming is got $1.350 million in debt. That is a minute. By go through with this project, it's going to cost the people in the town more money. It's not joke. Also, I would like it too hard. But there's two articles. They are written very well, but they mislead the people. In one way, I'll tell you why. Because they don't mention what's this $50,000, $30,000 they're going to do for the taxpayer. You don't tell me, or anybody can tell me, that you got to pay an engineering $50,000 to make a design. What about if this doesn't going to be approved? What happened to that fifty thousand dollars? It's going to come from us, right, for the taxpayer, or, the, or you're going to reimburse anybody. The project is good, no question about that, because you know we go and uh, we we got to improve ourselves, no question about it. But it's not the time, and also people they got to relate with other people, with the people that pay the bills. It's it. If they do that, the people in Little Town, they're going to start to really realize that this project, it will do something good about them. In the long term, 
is going to do something very good for the people in the town. Right now, these two articles over here, as well they are being written, doesn't budget, doesn't budget, doesn't budget. You know, AI, AI really started from tomorrow, start to talk with people to really reject this proposal. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'd like to comment on, on actually both of those last two points from Brian and from Rudy. Um, uh, lost my thought from Brian's comment there. For, uh, for Rudy, the, uh, our, one of our primary focuses is to leverage any investment the town makes with funding that comes from someone other than the taxpayers of the town. And I think what we've tried to demonstrate here today and what this group will continue to do over the course of the next year and beyond is to take any investment the town makes, thirty-one dollars to $61,000 here that we're talking about this year, and leverage that with the $28,000 of private funding, the $30,000 of grant money, and that's just where we're getting started. Our goals are certainly well beyond that. So worst case scenario, we get an investment that is equal to or greater than what the taxpayers are putting in this year, plus we have a plan that is going to need to be executed at some point in the future to fix the infrastructure that is the oldest in town. So I, regardless of what happens beyond this year, I think it's still a good deal for the town and good value to support. Bruce uh, Havlar. John, I think you do a good job. Okay. But let me go back to article, was it 11? Uh, I believe the town has the rights to buy right-of-ways, any, okay? And to get to, I don't know, you can trade stuff, but I'm not sure if this article is written that you can legally buy and sell property without a description of something. I'm, no one in their right mind is going to, uh, when you go back and check it out legally, they're not going to give you the power to do it. There's an article in here that says that it has to go in front of the people, and that's not in front of the people to be able to go back in here and buy and sell property out of it if you want to, even if it's in the same area. You've got to come up with plans, and that's the only way they're going to Prove it when you get down to it. If you check with it, the legal part of the state of New Hampshire, I don't think you're correct on that one. But uh, I, I, I think you're going a long way. When I served on that industrial park, but when we did this, we knew where we were going, and we had an end result. I look at this project, and I don't think you guys know where you're going, and I don't think you got an end result. And I think that literally, if you're going to come back to the people in here and ask for humongous amounts of things, and specifically if you're starting to give now, you still don't have the answers to it. And I have a hard time convincing myself the fact that we should be going for this, not to say the fact that we should be improving down there, the river's a great project and stuff like this, but I don't think you know where you're going. And I don't think you know where you're going financially or anything else on it. And I think you're putting the cart before the horse. Thank you. Okay, I think, Brian, you were next. Uh-oh. Are you yielding? Okay. So, Mr. Smith, um, I have been concerned, I guess, on two fronts. Can everyone One, hear? No. 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 Um, I'm not sure if I, is that any better? Uh, yes. Yeah. Better. I'm concerned on two fronts. Uh, I don't know if we got your name. Okay. Sylvia Smith. Okay, good. Uh, on, one, on the one hand, I think this is a really terrible time. Uh, people are really struggling. People on fixed incomes are really struggling. I think there's going to be a, rea a reaction from many people. Why are we doing this now? We, we really just need to dig ourselves out of a hole. Why are we doing this now? My second concern is whenever these types of projects come up, people talk about grants, it's not going to, well those grants come from the taxpayers and unfortunately they frequently come with strings that people hadn't anticipated like Westchester County, New York where they ran into major issues taking a federal grant and ended up having to expend a lot of money in fines because they didn't adhere to some detail. So that's concerning to me also. I, I would be curious who is issuing these grants, are they HUD grants? What are the strings attached to them? Uh, so those are my concerns.
got a couple comments and a suggestion. Um, if it was just infrastructure, uh, which is water lines, sewer, sidewalks, and stuff like that, uh, we wouldn't have needed a charrette. I was there at the charrette, and uh, they were planning all sorts of things. Um, the charrette had to do with redevelopment, uh, economic development. And uh, we're talking about infrastructure, which is sidewalks, and here we're asking for $113,000 for Pleasant Street. Uh, I think we need to get Pleasant Street fixed before we go someplace else. Uh, it was said that the industrial park uh, saved the taxpayers, I think, around $9 million or something like that. Well, it never saves the taxpayer a penny unless the taxpayer, their taxes are lowered, and I haven't seen that. Uh, my suggestion is that um, uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm ready to uh, vote yes for these. Does that surprise you, Margie? Yep. Yeah. Uh, but that's if we treat this as a corporation, that the taxpayers become shareholders to share in the profits of this, and uh, whatever amount a taxpayer chooses to put into this corporation or company, they would be able to be, uh, have that removed, that amount removed from their, from their taxpayers, from their taxes. And if no profits, then the trustees of this group should be fired for malfeasance. I knew you were really going to vote yes. <laughs> you make it a corporation where the taxpayers are going to get some profit, I will vote yes. Uh, Brian Ward, uh, I support these two uh, Warren articles. I'm not a member of the commission. I have been one of the 70 people that have participated in the meetings. It's been very <coughs> open. Um, they've advertised, and I guess John's had been on, he's actually a TV personality, he's on Channel 2 so often now, but uh, reaching out to let the community know what's going on. Uh, these two uh, follow a long tradition in Littleton of taking responsibility for our future. In the early 60s, uh, we put in a sewage treatment plant to help save uh, Saranac Club. Didn't work out, but it was the basis so that 10 years later, a group of individuals came together uh, LIDC, and we now have a world-class industrial park, and as John said, for $1 million worth of town investment, uh, there's a total of leverage, another $3 million. Uh, that has 14 businesses, 1,100 to 1,200 jobs, and approximately $60 million in payroll. Uh, for $1 million investment, um, I don't think there's any town in America that wouldn't say that was a good deal. <coughs> 20 years later, and what that all started with? was a $15,000 appropriation at town meeting in 1973, Carol was there, uh, that started to look in Littleton as to what industrial, where would the best place be for an industrial park. $15,000 well spent. 20 years later, uh, we had a different problem. Early 90s, we had uh, 17 vacancies on Main Street. Uh, we had a world-class industrial park. We didn't have a road or an X or a bridge to it, uh, but our economy was hurting across the board. We came together as a community, over 70 people came together, worked on the Industri Littleton Industrial Development Task Force. In 1995, our tax base was $241 million. Uh, less than 15 years later, we were at 794. We tripled our tax base by our collective efforts to work across the board, and one of the major reasons was uh, the Main Street, which became our energy center, our tourism. We reinvented it. Uh, what we're hoping to do, what the Commission is hoping to do, and I think hopefully we as a community will support them, is do the same thing for the river area. The river area was our first industrial park. At one time there were five dams. The last one was built in 1936. When the town, when Saranac Club closed in the mid-60s, we kind of forgot about that area for economic development uh, proactively. However, 25 different buildings have been taken down in that area. Uh, the, the Bank of New Hampshire building took down nine, where the parking is, took down six. Twenty-five buildings were taken down. Now that was the easy part, to tear them down. Bruce talked about demolition. What is scary about the infrastructure down there is nobody knows where most of the water, sewer lines and storm drains are going. And we know that when they redid Main Street, Jerry Eames is here, he had a swimming pool in the bottom of the theater building when they plugged off because they didn't know where that went. So the infrastructure that needs to be done down there, that is, whether we do the plan or not, it is something that's a solid investment. Every time there's a major rainstorm, 
we have flooding down there. I think, did you mention 28,000 it cost us this summer for that? Almost, almost 40. Almost 40. And that's not the first one. That we've had many of that. So the infrastructure to do that, and as I urged before at the budget here, drive from, uh, uh, drive from one end of Mill Street to Saranac and back, back and forth. That is a, an area that we tore buildings down but never developed a plan. I think the plan that they're going to come up with, and everyone's talking about, how are we going to pay for it? Well, one of the things that we've always been successful in Littleton is developing ideas and then finding alternative funding sources to match them. Town building, $1.5 million upgrade. Taxpayers are responsible for $500,000. The three bridges we built, state and federal paid 40%, we paid 20%. Project after project after project. In the early 90s, we developed a collective vision, and Ed Hennessy, myself, Paul McGoldrick, uh, I think Jerry went with us, we went down and met with a congressional delegation. And we said, we have a vision, similar to what Martin Luther King said, he had a dream, we had a vision. And the delegation, we met with the congressman, both sent his office, and they were very polite to us. And they said, well, that's fine. We thought we'd give them their vision, they'd put a plan together and come back. And they said, no, it's not the way it works. You've got to develop your plan with credible plans based upon engineering help. You come back to us, partner with the appropriate state agencies, work with the federal uh, funding partners, and then once you've got your plan in place and a credible plan, then we will help fund it. That's the way it works. This is the same first step that we're doing here that they did with the industrial park. It's the same first step in 1993 when the town voted $50,000 to support the Littleton Economic Development Task Force. And it's in an area that many have talked about our limitations here in the North Country, and there are many. We are physically isolated. But that river is a great asset. It was the reason why Littleton was created in the first place, and it has a potential to be even a stronger portion of our community, and I urge everyone to support it. And the final point is, when this plan is developed with technical expertise, any of the expansions are coming back to the voters. Nine different uh, allocations of LIDC went back before. And I think uh, with all of the hard work from John and his team, I think we need to support the younger people that are getting involved. John with his skill set, Jimmy McMahon, they've just done a phenomenal job and actually they've done a better job than LIDC in a shorter period of time and I can say they did a better, better job the Littleton Economic Development Task Forces. They made, they've learned from every single mistake we made. I don't want to list them all because that'd be too depressing. But they've learned from us. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Greg Allaire, uh, Littleton Chamber President. Um, <clears throat> we've been looking for somebody to step up uh, like this for a long time. And uh, there was a group that was put together a while back, 2020, um, to look, you know, not in the near future, but, in, you know, further out for projects like these. Um, one thing to just keep in mind is uh, Littleton Main Street is 100% occupied right now. We are busting at the seams, and it's businesses that want to come in. So it's important for us to find ways to grow around the Main Street area. And this would be an opportunity to gain more revenue. Brian's gone over almost everything I want to cover. But you say, if you're not getting money back, Dan, I disagree. If you're saving on taxes, that's money saved in your pocket. So I hope everybody approves this. Thank you. Anyone else? Are you ready for the question? Um, the articles will have to be placed separately. So we'll, we'll take them. One at a time. Article 11 is open already. Oh, yeah. Already, yeah. It's already open, but 12 is. 12 Article months. 11 is, <coughs> right, it's been open. We've linked the discussion of 12. Are we ready to vote on both? Okay. No, not on both. Not on both. On okay, on 11. Article 11 placed on the ballot. 
for the March 11th election. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no? No. Okay. And then I move to, play, to place Article 12 as written on the ballot. Second. <coughs> and we've had discussion. Discussion. So to formalize that, Article 12, you ready for the question? Yeah, All sure. those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no? No. Yeah, the ayes have it for Article 11 and 12. We're up to Article 13. Article 13 is the town building, community meeting room, and the opera house. Opera house, town building. Article 13 reads, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $35,000 to renovate, repair, improve, clean, and furnish, including purchase tables, chairs, and other furnishings, the selectmen's meeting room and the town building opera house. To authorize a withdrawal of $3,000 from the Opera House Special Revenue Fund. To further authorize the use of $15,000 to come from the undesignated, unreserved fund balance. With the remaining $17,000 to come from business, community donations, and grants. There would be no tax impact in this year. This is recommended by the Selectmen 3-0. Not recommended by the Budget Committee 5-3. Um, Brian, do you want to talk about this one? We originally, the uh, Board of Selectmen, oh, okay, I'm going to move to to open this for, to place this on the uh, ballot. Okay, no, second. second to the Yeah, yeah. no, second to this. All right, all in favor of getting it on the floor, say aye. Aye. Oh, no. Okay. okay, all right. This article changed from the way it was originally presented to the Budget Committee. The Budget Committee re-voted in support of it. I don't recall the vote. Okay, so we don't know what the number is, but instead of not recommended by, by a score of five to three, it's recommended by some other number. I believe it was five to two what I saw. In when, support? In support of it when the, uh, I saw it on channel two when they re-voted on it. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, we were going to take this. We were going to, just one second here, Brian. Sorry to call you up and then make you wait. But we we originally voted. Um, the board of selectmen voted three to one against even putting this, supporting this. Two right, right. Two to one against against. <laughs> sorry, we had an extra selectman that day. Um, Milt and Mike did not want to support this, and I did, and. Um, so we weren't even going to put it on the. We weren't even going to put it up for consideration, but some people in the community heard that that's what was happening, and decided that they wanted to bring a different idea forward. And that idea included having, having the uh, business and community support it uh, financially. And that's what I want to have Brian talk to you about. This is uh, when, when I watched the debate occur and read about it. I was amazed uh, about how, regardless. Of what position you took, everybody was right. Uh, the selectmen originally voted two to one. Uh, two selectmen thought that uh, this was something that we shouldn't do this year. Um, their points were well taken. You guys hear Brian in the back? <laughs> Sorry. I watched uh, or followed the vote, and the selectmen voted, Mike and Mel voted two to one against it, and they were concerned about the taxpayer implications. Totally legitimate point. Margie made the point that she felt that this was a good appropriation because the town had been incrementally supporting upgrading the, the Opera House and that they needed to use the building. She was right. I don't think anybody disagreed with that. So after thinking about it, I said, well, maybe the thing to do is to create a partnership between the town to raise the money from the business and the community uh, to offset what the taxpayers uh, would would be funded here, the way it's been structured, there would be no um, additional uh, funds raised uh, to pay for the town share uh, and, the, and the business community, they, they would raise 18,000, the business community would raise 17,000. So I went, spoke to Milt, he said, sounds a good idea, I'll take it back to the selectmen. I went to the selectmen, they supported three to nothing, and then the budget committee voted five to two. Um, 
I watched it, and one of the people that voted against it was my good friend Tony Alagua. And Tony made points, of which he was right. And the point that Tony made, which he wasn't against it, but he felt that there was a need for a comprehensive plan to finish the Opera House. It's a very good point. Call him up, spoke to him about it. And I think that's true. Uh, however, uh, this is a way to get that room finished uh, so that we can continue in an incremental basis uh, to uh, finish the Opera House. Uh, the original plan was to, uh, to save the Opera House, make it structurally sound, be able to insulate it, uh, do everything we need, and then plug away at it. Historical Society has done a wonderful job on their museum. The Chamber of Commerce uh, paid for the whole uh, rehab of their area, which was a good partnership. I believe there's been multiple uh, votes by the town to make improvements into the Opera House, I believe a year ago. That was done, uh, and we have new tables and a new, uh, uh, new screen. Uh, so we, we've spent money to kid continue the process. So what I've urged, which the Budget Committee has supported and the Slotman has supported, that we create this type of partnership. Now this has been done before. In 2008, um, the community house uh, folks came to uh, the Board of Selectmen and said, we need to make some improvements to the property. And we said, uh, okay, uh, we'll match you, 10,000 for 10,000. The community house people went ahead and did it. Uh, and so that was a partnership uh, that improved the community house and continued the long-term partnership, which has actually been in place since 1920 for the town supporting the community house. So I hope you'll support it uh, and that we can, again, create another partnership to, uh, again, move the, the town building along to finish it. Thank you. Somebody behind you, please. No, no, go ahead. George Mitchell, um, as most of you know, I've had sort of an interest in what's been going on in the Opera House over the course of the past few years. Um, one of the questions I have, one of the three questions, and I'll just run down them. Uh, number one, is there a master plan for the use of the rest of the Opera House? The first floor is completely unfinished at this point. Um, this part of particular room that I think we're speaking of is part of the third floor, and I believe it's the old courtroom area of the uh, Opera House. And then there was another section beside that that is a little bit bigger than that, another room that's presently unfinished. And I'm sort of curious if there is a master plan for the rest of the building that is unfinished and if this falls into the master plan, or if we're doing this, not considering what's going to happen to the other areas, um, just because we feel there's a need for a, uh, a meeting room of this sort. The other question that I have is, is there a real need for the meeting room? I can think of several spaces in town that are mostly usable at this time and uh, can be used you know, as a you know, you just call and make arrangements and they can be used. So is there a real need? The third question that I have is uh, there is a 45-year easement left with the Department of Historic Resources in New Hampshire for anything that goes on in the Opera House. And uh, has this plan to uh, change this into a meeting room, has it met the requirements of the Department of Historic Resources? But again, uh, George, I'll try to take those in order. Um, as far as a master plan, um, there is the Opera House uh, Committee that is working on that. Um, there, we do not have a written master plan. Um, the meeting room that you described is the old selectman's room, the old uh, uh, courtroom. Uh, does is fairly close to being brought back into serviceability and, and use. Um, so it is an incremental plan. Um, if we had a master plan, we'd be looking at uh, a large investment in money. We think this is a, a good return for a relatively small investment in money. Um, the need, uh, I, I do believe there is a need. We uh, <clears throat> meet at the community house very often, and we have scheduling conflicts there. Uh, the community house board of directors recently closed the annex, which was the other primary meeting room we used. 
uh, for an indefinite period. Uh, it's going to take a lot of money and resources to get that meeting room reopened. Uh, and uh, I've, we use the uh, main venue of the Opera House on occasion, uh, but it's very difficult to hear. Um, when we have selectmen's meetings there and, and other meetings we've, we've had, um, you know, if you have a large group meeting, the Opera House uh, venue area is great, but if you've got uh, a dozen or 20 people, uh, you just can't hear and, it, and you're over overpowered by, by that room. So I think there is a need, <clears throat> and as far as the uh, uh, Department of Historical Resources easement, um, I have been in touch with them uh, and they're aware of our, our plan and they just say that you, um, there's, there's no prohibition for us to use it as a meeting room. It's just the furnishings and how we do it uh, have to be consistent with the historic uh, resource guidelines. Uh, so I have talked with them and uh, the woodwork will be consistent and uh, lighting will be consistent and, and all of that type of thing. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay, next. Dan here. The, uh, at one time we talked about having the students, the Middleton High School students, doing the work there, but uh, it turns out that there's lead in the paint in the room. And I was wondering if uh, this couldn't be reconsidered, that uh, just asking for enough money to have a professional company come in and remove the lead paint and let the students do the rest. Um, you are correct. We did talk to the uh, CTC, and, and the problem is the, the lead paint. Um, and at that, from that discussion with them, they determined that they really didn't want to have any further involvement in, with it. So I moved on and have been talking with private contractors that are lead, bait, lead uh, paint abatement specialists. Uh, so that, that's who would be using for the, the primary work. Once that is done, uh, if the uh, CTC students want to come back in, I'm certainly willing to open that discussion, but we have to abate the lead issue first before they can even, uh, you're even willing to talk to us. Okay, Fred, the question is then, uh, is this money, this $35,000, and then there's going to be another, well, I don't know how much all there is together in here, is that uh, just for doing the paint removal, or is that for doing, you know, rehabbing the whole thing? It's to get the, get the room back in use for, for meetings. So, so the answer to my question is, it's not only for the paint, the lead paint removal, it's also for doing the other work. And that's, that's what I'm suggesting, that we table this, just get enough money to do the, the paint removal, and then have the students do the rest. Okay. Uh, further questions, comments on this? Uh... My name is Art Green, and I've always admired the Opera House and uh, wanted to uh, have more activities going on there that we can so we can enjoy it. Um, I know that there are very successful businesses in town that. Uh, we could probably approach, as was mentioned in this warrant article, uh, to see if they would make contributions, and this certainly uh, goes along with that. Uh, it's a beautiful building. Uh, if you don't go appreciate uh, professional wrestling, then uh, we don't use it very often, but uh, I'd welcome the opportunity to go there and, and have meetings, and uh, I think uh, the right approach is to ask uh, successful businesses in our area who are involved in building construction to uh, help us out. Okay. Further questions, comments? Are you ready for the question? Okay. Those in favor of placing Article 13 on the ballot, March 11th, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. And it is a vote.
Turn your paper up to Article 14. Article 14, restructuring, repaving, and upgrading various town roads. And you'll see that in uh, two boxes, one continue. Uh, in Article 14, to see if the town will vote to raise an appropriate amount not to exceed $430,243. For the purpose of designing, engineering, paving, and upgrading various town roads and sewer systems related to those roads. High Street, East End, Park Ave to Pleasant Street. Estimated cost, $174,000, 74, $194. Let's see, coming from sewer replacement, connection, and sewer restricted fund balances. Carlton Street, estimated cost, $152,260. Coming from the sewer replacement, connection, and sewer restricted fund balance. Partridge Lake, number two, Parker Camp to Herrick Road, estimated cost, $54,396. Brook Road, Reddington Street to Littleton Town Line, estimated to cost $49,393. Any savings seen during the, these projects will be used for and expended on crushing and recycling old pavement for use on these roads and other various roads. Tax impact, 28 cents, recommended by the Selectmen, 3 to 0, recommended by the Budget Committee, 5 to 3. And I move that uh, to the floor for discussion. Second. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed now? That gets it done. Two of them. You ready for questions? I'll see if I can okay. answer them. All right. So the warning. Every time we pave a road and there's a culvert where there's a drain, they don't lift that drain up. And I don't want to pay for any more roads that they don't lift the drain up. Every time I hit that Dells Road and my tire goes <coughs> down, they go swamp. It's not right and it's engineering inappropriate. And if we're going to spend the money, we need to do it properly. So I would like an uh, honor system from the selectmen that they will see that that no longer happens. George? George, did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Dan here. We're asking for money to do the Saranac Street area, and we've got streets that need be need to be repaired. Why can't we just take that money and put it on the streets? And uh, you, you guys are just asking too much of the taxpayers who, who aren't getting their raises, who aren't, who aren't making money like the public, public works people do. Um, you got to have a little bit of, uh, of a soft spot for the taxpayer. Anyone else? Further comments? Ready for the question? Article 14. Those in favor of placing it on the ballot, say aye. Aye. Those no? No. Okay. Let's go to the affirmative. Article 15. Article 15. Purchase of police cruiser to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $37,500 for the purpose of purchasing and, and setup of a 2014 or newer police cruiser as a replacement for an older cruiser in service uh, in the Littleton Police Department, set amount to come from the undesignated, unreserved fund balance, and further to authorize the selectmen to trade in or sell an older cruiser for the purpose of reducing the cost of the new cruiser. Uh, tax impact is zero. It's really not zero, it's zero in the current year, but this will cost us a nickel in terms of the tax money that's left over from last year that's called the unencumbered fund balance. Okay? But there is no actual new tax impact for this year, but obviously this is going to cost us some money. Okay. Uh, 
Recommended by the selectmen three to zero. Recommended by the budget committee six to two. I move that we place this article on the floor for discussion. Second. I have a second. Second. Yeah. Okay. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, let me talk about this vehicle for a second, because I drove in it. I rode in it, I should say. I didn't drive it. Um, it's a 2008 Dodge Charger. It has 136,303 miles on the day I, I was in it. It has rusty rocker panels. It has rusty, it has rusty fender wells and back door well seams. Remember last year I told you I ran my hand underneath the body of the one that we had up for sale last year or up for replacement and uh, this one has the same rust spots. The riding experience, this, this vehicle has had seven front end uh, repairs done to it, not full replacements but repairs. Um, we went up Far Hill Road, we, we drove around for a while and it has rather large uh, loud knocking sounds, rattles, vibrations. The total repair costs here from October of 2009 to November of 2013 has been $7,365 in repairs, not service, just repairs. Uh, the front end work came to $2,300 because we have computers I can show you. The yellow bills are the front end. And you can notice that from July of 2013 on, there was a lot of front end work done on this vehicle. I want to talk about that and emphasize it because we're not talking about rotation here. We're talking about the replacement of a vehicle that truly is in need of uh, renewal uh, or a new vehicle replacing it. Um, the, uh, a lot of cars in town have 136,000 miles on it, but a lot of cars aren't driven like these cars are driven every day by different drivers and uh, this vehicle clearly needs to be replaced and we really ask you for your support here, but I'll take questions or any discussion you may have. There's I was just gonna go sit down, but maybe we can put a snow plow on this one too. <laughs> yes, it is. Any, any, other, any other questions or comments? Right. Brian Hadlock. Um, actually, back when I remember when we bought this cruiser, and I will attest that it has been nothing but a lemon. Um, it was known for pretty much uh, when they purchased it, it was going to be a lemon, but unfortunately, it's the only police cruisers that were available at the time. Uh, so, these cars were known in all departments, state police, everybody is getting rid of them because they're just a cost, constant maintenance problem. The problem I see and I want to address is the rust. We have a Sally Fort and there were contractors who built buildings in this town for their own maintenance snow plowing equipment. I brought this to the uh, select board's attention many times. I brought it to the police departments many times. If these cruisers are going to be kept inside, whether it's for an hour or four hours, the temperature of that Sally Fort has to be kept at 40 degrees or less. That's why it's rusting out. Other vehicles that, yes, it's on the road a lot, uh, but if it's cold outside, vehicles don't rust. It's rusting because when they're inside, they're, it's just the chemical change with the salt. Uh, whether it's the highway to department or whatever, if they're working on the vehicles, yeah, you bring the temperature up, but after that, you drop it back down. My opinion, and again, that's my own personal opinion, it's a way to get vehicles changed over quicker. But, you know, this is something that we need to, I don't know what the temperature is in there. I haven't gone in and checked. It's all under lock and key. But, you know, I think the select board should be stating that, you know, the Sally Port needs to be kept. And you can look it up on the Internet or wherever. But basically they're stating that any vehicles that are kept in under concrete floors need to be kept below 40 degrees in order not to rust. There were, again, contractors in this community who built their own garages, they learned the hard way, they bought brand new trucks in less than two years, they were completely rusted out, the frames and the underbody. So this is just something, again, just to keep our taxes lower and hopefully make these things last longer. Any other comments or questions? 
Okay, that's Article 15. You ready for the question? Yes. All those in favor, placing it on the ballot, say aye. Aye. I don't know. The ayes have it. Article 16. Article 16, upgrade and update of police cruiser safety slash communications equipment to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $11,000 for the purpose of purchasing, installing, and improving police cruisers with updated safety and communications equipment and to authorize the withdrawal of $11,000 from the special detail revenue fund and further to authorize the police chief to trade in or sell older equipment. There's no tax impact here. The money would be coming out of the revenue fund recommended by the selectmen 3 to 0, recommended by the budget committee 8 to 0. I move that we place this article on the floor for discussion. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Second. Favorite guy? Aye. 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 no. Open for discussion. Questions? Dan? Uh, since Paul Smith is here, I wanted to ask him. I uh, was curious about the temperature in the Sally Port. Do you know what temperature that is? And what, what you guys are keeping that at? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, a quick, a quick answer, but that's not really germane to this topic. I, I understand. Okay. I, All right. Take it off. Uh, we turn the heat off all the way down to 50 on the thermostat, so. It, you can ask parking enforcement, it's quite cold in the Sally Port, and we only use the Sally Port when we have inclement weather. We pull the vehicles in so they're not iced over. They're primarily parked outside. We do pull it in to process arrests. Okay. Thank you. Back, back online. Thank you. Are there, are there any other questions or, or comments? I did have a question. Where did we move? No, 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 we're on this one, on the equipment. Uh, somebody asked me why the selectmen have the, uh, the authority to you know, sell the cruiser but not the equipment. And we don't really sell the cruiser. The police chief is responsible for placing that, but we have to approve the bidding. Whatever, whatever the high bid is, we, we have to approve it, and that's why it's worded that way. In terms of this article, with selling the, the used equipment, the cage that's in the back or whatever else, uh, they, they would be updating. Um, that, that's left up to the chief to do. The money from that sale comes back into the general fund. Right? Do you have a question? Quick, quick question for the chief. <clears throat> you asked the park enforcement officer to verify that it's 50 in there. Is that where his office is located? It is. <laughs> I learned something. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Thank you. You ready for the question? Yes. Yeah. for you want Article 16 placed on the ballot for the March 11th meeting. All the papers say aye. 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 No. The ayes have it. We're on to Article 17. <coughs> Hill of Town Property, Article 17, but I may ask for your assistance here on this one. Uh, shall the Board of Selectmen be authorized without further town meeting action to subdivide, exchange, and or sell the following town property, including development rights, uh, after two duly noticed public hearings and consultation with the Town Planning Board and Conservation Commission in accordance with RSA 41 colon 11 4A? We have Four parcels here. The location is 1213 Mount Eustis Road, map lot number 9917, approximately 40 to 50 acres. Um, it's vacant land, an old gravel pit for industrial development. Meadow Street, uh, map lot 769, approximately acres 12, tax sale floodplain for wetland mitigation. Industrial Park Road, 8215 is the map lot numbers. Uh, approximate acres 8.5, 8 tax sale, floodplain, and steep slopes for wetland mitigation. And 354 Pleasant Street, 6743 is the map lot numbers. Uh, 0.21 acre uh, manufacturing housing lot. We have four uh, pictures, four or five pictures, but I'll make a motion that we uh, place this article on the floor for discussion. Second. 
Second. Favor, say aye. No. Are, are there any questions here regarding any of these parcels? Uh, Bruce Havlock. I, uh, I inquired by going back to the town building and I inquired the last time on what they were going to do. Now, the item that you see on 1213 Mount Eustace Road is a piece of property in turn that was acquired by the people of Littleton from uh, Mr. Little on it, and it was, uh, I think it was probably pretty close to 100 acres of land, because I think the stamp company in turn, or the, the uh, coin company in turn, is out of the same parcel. <clears throat> the townspeople in turn paid $25,000 for it, and I and they paid five thousand dollars a year every year for the five years as to acquiring the property now i am a stockholder in the industrial park as the people that own it and it's my belief that this is where the property is going to go to they haven't really told you that yet but that's where they're going to go to. and i believe if they're going to do it they should pay the taxpayers back at least that amount of money it's on the town assessments the entire parcel for four for the land only of four hundred and twelve thousand dollars on it so it's my belief if we're going to be voting to liquidate or to sell it that the community ought to at least get what they got in and back out of it for a, 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 even for a part of it from that end of it. that would be number one uh, and number two the piece on the uh, metal out of it is I, I was quite surprised at the last meeting I went to that the town picked this property up because they had for years and I and I'll give Mr. Folk credit out of it, he turned it down when he was on the board of taking it back on taxation out of it because of the fact that in the deeds on that piece of property you can't use it for anything it's a piece next to Walmart um, now the town has taken it they gave up the taxation on it and didn't collect any money from it, and they got it for nothing. I mean, they got it, but we still got, we didn't get any of the taxes on it. So they negotiated to get it without the taxes on the thing on it. And now they got a piece of property, if you read in the deed, it can never be used for anything. Putting it on here to sell it, as far as I'm concerned, the only way you should try to do this is probably to convert it over and give it to the Parks Department maybe the parks department in turn could negotiate with it to be able to get something out of the state to, to reverse the cycle because you'll never ever be able to use that property the way it's laid out in the deeds on it for anything on it. and no one's going to buy the thing on it once they read the deeds believe me i hired an attorney last year to and uh, brian wood was the attorney at the time and i looked into buying it myself on the thing on it and when i read it there wasn't a way you could in turn ever use the thing for anything. So to put it on here, I think it's kind of ridiculous to try to put it on here for selling purposes out of the thing on it. I was I was very much surprised that the town ever took it because now we were losing about twelve grand out of the thing on it too. Thank you. Uh, your first point on the uh, the purchase price, uh, Bruce. Um, we you'll see in the in the handout um, towards the end of this this section. Uh, we did a similar. Uh, the town did a similar deal when they sold the uh, coin company parcel, um, and that has returned uh, thirty five thousand uh, dollars, thirty six thousand dollars a year to the town in annual taxation. Um, so. Uh, and I believe the, the uh, coin company did pay whatever the costs were for uh, subdividing and, and drafting up the deed on that parcel. Um, so sometimes it's not always in the inherent value of the land, it's in what it can produce to the, the town in uh, future tax revenue and jobs uh, into the future. Uh, I, I maintain that we have received that $25,000 over, many times over from from uh, selling that parcel to the coin company. As far as the Meadow Street uh, parcel goes, 
Um, I do have a copy of the deed. Um, I, I, you know, I read it and, and I don't see where it says you can't do anything with it. Um, the, the town was not getting any taxation on this. The owner was uh, settling his, all of his finances um, as he was getting very old. And uh, when I talked to his attorney, there was no way they were ever going to pay any, anything to the town. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was a lost leader for us to take it with the idea that when other development occurs down in the meadow, that the town may be able to sell the development rights or the, the rights for uh, that parcel uh, for wetland mitigation. Um, so other parcels down in the meadow that impact the wetland, if they need a, a match on, on wetland mitigation, the town may be able to, to sell this. Uh, for that development, yeah, thus encouraging you, other development. You, you can't do that. You've already done that once, and you're not allowed to under the law to do it twice. Um, so those are the, those are the, the thoughts. Um, whether we can do it or whether we can't, um, what's the harm in, in giving the town the authorization to do that? Uh, Mike Dickerman, uh, I think it's kind of ironic Last year, I can't remember if it was at the budget hearing or the deliberative session, for the selectmen they had proposed buying, uh, buying or selling for, for some several pieces of property. And Mr. Hadlock objected, saying we shouldn't sell those, we should use those for wetlands mitigation. This seems like a perf perfect parcel to use for wetlands mitigation if the town has to use it. Well, that was a year ago. You can't do that anymore. The state, in turn, will no longer allow you to mitigate. That's the first thing. What the state wants now is money. They've gone into it and said it. But on this one here, these parcels of land were used for mitigation before by Sofran out of it when they sold to, to uh, Walmart. And consequently, you can't use them or sell them twice out of the thing on it. But the fact is, the law, when I spoke, I was honest about it at that time. But now they've changed their mind. The state of New Hampshire now will not let you mitigate. They want dollars out of the thing. That's what they do. Thank you. Okay. Tony? I have a question on the 1213 Mount Eustace Road. First of all, 40 to 50 acres, couldn't you come closer with a figure than that? Right. Secondly, I'd like to see the map that's on page 57, can you bring that up and show us what you're talking about? Uh, your first question, 40, 50 acres, we don't really know. Um, and that's, that's the, the challenge. Um, the town is working with LIDC. LIDC has one or more businesses that want to uh, expand on that parcel. Um, they haven't settled in on the exact location or size or needs of, of their potential uh, burden hand client. Um, and we have not looked at what all of the uh, drainage requirements might be for a parcel, for that parcel. But generally, we would be putting in a roadway uh, adjacent to the transfer station going into the upper uh, gravel pit area and um, progressing up into the back part of the land and there would be uh, a development site here um, and maybe maybe one more uh, out behind. Okay, I agree with that, but the way you have that it looks to me like you could sell a whole thing, which would mean you'd be selling the transfer station out of business. Oh, I'm sorry, this just came off the town tax, tax map uh, as a way to highlight the parcel as opposed to adjacent parcels. We're going to have two hearings. If you look at this, you know, we have to have two hearings before the planning, the uh, planning board and the conservation commission, and those hearings will have a much more delineated plan. All right, but you're not, can you assure me that you are not going to sell the whole parcel, that you're going to divide it out? Can you assure me of that? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. Tom Alton. In 
uh, reference to the Meadow Street parcel, uh, the Conservation Commission is in charge of monitoring mitigated wetlands, quite a few of them in town. And this is one of them. Uh, I think we've got the paperwork somewhere that that land was already used for mitigation purposes. And uh, it just would be pretty difficult to understand if it hadn't been sitting right there with all the development that has taken off since in the Meadow Bay. A number of big, big block stores would have been fighting over that. Brian Ward, uh, at the budget hearing, uh, Bruce raised his issues as to whether the town should, uh, uh, LIDC should pay the town for the land that they're acquiring. And the question was asked, haven't we already done this before? And I nodded my head and said, yes, we had transferred it. I didn't have the paperwork with me at the time, so I went to the Grafton County, and in 1997, excuse me, I went to the town reports. In 1997, the town uh, voted to authorize a conveyance of land uh, to LIDC for a nominal amount. I then subsequently went down, and the transaction didn't actually occur until 1998 by the time they got all of the information as to what was the appropriate size of the lot. Uh, and I believe there were two lots that were conveyed, isn't that right, Fred? The Mosiki lot? I think so. And uh, also the coin company lot. Uh, and so those were transferred to LIDC. They then developed it, sold them, uh, buildings were put in. But Bruce's point as far as this piece of property, in 1969, we paid $25,000 for 125 acres, paid 5000 a year for five years. It was almost as good a deal as the Dutch got for Manhattan, but it was one of the best deals we've ever made. And I think uh, with the history of LIBC developing this piece, uh, other pieces that are out of this piece, uh, we're going to get back a heck of a lot more than we've got into it. Uh, and I think what, Fred, did you say 36,000 the coin companies paying? Just in, in town taxes, 91, over 90,000 in town and school taxes annually. 90,000? Okay. Well, thank you. Okay, further discussion. Are you ready for the question? Article 17. All those in favor of placing Article 17 on the ballot say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. So, at this point, we probably hold the only folks here. Uh, I was told prior to the meeting that Articles 18 to 21. Uh, our candidates to be lumped, unless somebody has some specific <coughs> questions, and it would require a vote to do it. There is one <coughs> one um, change: the numbers in number twenty-one should should be in numbers in number twenty, and vice versa. The numbers got reversed. Can you yeah, it's just that the numbers got reversed. The numbers oh. that are in 21 should be in 20 and... Which numbers? The dollar amount? The dollar amount, right. right. The dollar amounts need to be switched uh, between 20 and 21. So Article 20 would be $1,930, and Article 21 would be the $3433. And that correction would, of course, has already been noted and would be clear on the ballot. So what's your pleasure? Mm -hmm. What? <coughs> we do. We do have to, yeah. Well, oh, to change the numbers? Yeah. Okay, we can do that. We can do that first, if you wish. Somebody want to move that? The, the numbers that have been noted that the numbers in the uh, warrant for Article 20 really belong in 21, and what's in 21 belong in 20 as far as the dollars go. And you need to be switched. And that's seconded. Okay, those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no? Okay, 
Now the second second question, somebody wants to make a motion to lump 18 through 21. I hear the motion, okay. I hear a second. Okay. Discussion? Ready for the question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ready for it? For lumping, actually the, by the meeting's uh, pleasure, you are voting on lumping Article 18, 19, 20, 21. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. No. The ayes have it. Then we move to the petition articles. We do have a tradition here. Wait a second, now that we've lumped them all together, don't we have to vote to put them on? Okay, yeah, let's clarify that. And then the clarification for articles 18 and 21, we're voting to place them on the warrant as they are printed with that one exception that we voted on prior. Those in favor say aye. 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 No. Okay. So looking for articles, uh, beginning article 22, a petition article. And our tradition here has been, depends on your pleasure, whether they be placed on the ballot or if we can do otherwise if you wish. It's your pleasure. Uh, Brian. Brian Hadlock. Parks and Rec Commissioner. Uh, basically, I'm here to first answer any questions to of our petition warrant articles uh, 22, 23, 24, and 25. But first, uh, let me speak just a little bit on each one. Hold for a second. Can we? Do you, what's your pleasure? Do you want to continue or, and, or lump them or say, pull out all the ones? Or, I move we to? lump all the petition to, uh, warrant articles together and vote on them. Do you, you want them lumped together and I vote on them? And we have a second? Yeah. That's your pleasure? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a little interested voter, but Services, White Mountain Mental Health. So Human Services. Here. What article is that, ma'am? Thirty-one. Okay. Now, are you? Did you get permission to speak earlier before the meeting is? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, no. we'd yeah. have to clear that first, but we can do that. <laughs> okay. Complicating. Uh, question. Okay. Um, the North Country Home Health and Hospice Agency yeah. for twenty-one thousand five hundred dollars was inadvertently left off the warrant, but it is a valid petitioned article. So um, it reads, we the undersigned registered voters in the town of Whittleton hereby request the selection to place this petition warrant article on the 2014 warrant to see if the town okay. will vote to raise the program right. sum of 21,000. All, right, yeah. okay. yep. All right, so we've got a couple of things to do. Um, and let's take them in order, seeing that Brian is up there first. He, he can address articles 22 to 25 if we want him to. Point of order, we have a amendment. We have. Yeah, we do. Yeah, before the vote. Motion and a second. Do we have to vote on that? Well, before, before the vote, we have some uh, okay. uh, business to take care of. So. Brian, Brian is up here, and he, he can speak on Articles 22, 23, 24, if we, or 25, if we want him to. And then, then we have a request, it would require two things, for you to get permission to speak, and then to speak on Article 31. So let's take them in order, 22, 23, 24, 25, do you want to hear Brian's no. Oh, okay. okay, so can we, for the record now, and Brian's willing, but if, let's handle that with a motion. Do you yet to vote yes or no? Yes. On uh, 22, 23, 24, and 25. I would like to talk to 25, so whatever that means. Are we loaning just the parks and recreation ones? Or no, no we, have a, we have a motion on the floor to discuss uh, or to place all of the petition articles on the ballot. And this means you can discuss any of them. Does that include the social service? 
issues. But we didn't vote yes yet whether we would do right. that. Right. We did not vote yet whether we could do that. We are kind of opening it up for discussion, and then we'll vote. That's all it's for me, whether we will lump them or not. Exactly. Yeah. So what's germane is the article on the floor, and that is the lump all of the remaining articles. And we now know that a logistics point has to be made note of, and there's a legitimate petition article that needs to be added to the article. So our motion would include the inclusion of that. Should we vote yes? What number is that one? It's going to be 37. I believe, right? And that's, that's a, an article that town manager presented that um, was legitimate, that had these signatures ready to go, needs to be added, okay? So it would, that would be included in your vote. So then, question, point of order? Yeah, yeah I'm not sure. Um, if, if I have say, something to say about uh, Article 25, and people agree with me and they don't want to pass it, what's that going to do to it? The vote is so, so, so the motion that's on the floor... Yeah, right. That's your choice. So, so let, me, let me clarify. The motion that's on the floor that we're going to bring to you is to lump all of the remaining articles Articles, including the one that town manager <coughs> brought up. And the social service articles? All the articles. Right. All the articles. Because they will be on the ballot. So all those in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Those, no? No. So the ayes have it. Therefore, therefore, just for clarification, all of the remaining articles, petition articles, all of them. 22 to 37, <coughs> adding the one that we just learned about, will be placed on the ballot for my two levels. Can we hear what 37 is? Of course. You want to, you want to read it? Go ahead. Okay. It's, um, this is a petition article with all the signatures. We, the undersigned voters, on town will do hereby request a selectman to place this petition warrant article on a 2014 meeting to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 21500 to support the North Country Home Health and Hospice Agency visiting nurses for the underinsured Littleton residents. Uninsured and underinsured Littleton residents. Uh, that's the end of the... That's, that would be the end of the... Uh, is there a tax impact on that? Uh, it says 21500 and there's not any note as to tax impact. So we don't know whether there is or there is not. That's oh, right. there is. There, there is. is. There is. Okay. Um, it will be 2.8 <coughs> cents. 2.8 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. 2. cents. 2.8 cents. Okay, so what you have done by vote is basically in this meeting, uh, intend to a motion to adjourn. No, 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 Actually, what you what you what you did was bypass discussion. Now, he wanted to say no. We said yeah, he could stand up if he wanted to. But you've got three people who wanted to speak. Yeah. At least. At least. All right. So now wait a minute. Let's. Uh, and we understood that they would be allowed to speak. That was my understanding of what was going on there. But it was going on the warrant, no matter what. Right. Yeah. I, excuse me. <coughs> Mike Dickerman. I, I, it was my understanding you you asked if we wanted to lump them all together. We didn't say put them on the warrant yet. We just we said we'll lump them all together. Now we should be able to discuss them if people want to. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. That, is that your understanding? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you.
Right. Good job, Mike. So then, <laughs> so then, for clarification, strike that previous vote. Yes. Right. Hey, I, I think I think what I was actually what I was trying to say to you was that in tradition we have taken the remaining articles loved them and voted to put them on the warrant and without discussion. No, we've always had discussion before. We've, we've segmented two or three. We've said, all right, with the exception of 20 or 21, everything else goes on the ballot. So let's clarify that. I did not know that. Yeah. I, yeah. I okay, so what, what is your pleasure? We were talking about uh, the park and rec, lumping the park and rec together, and how do we get into all the other? Okay, we can reverse it. This is your meeting. So if you if you want to, let's let's break it down. If you want to hear an explanation of articles 22, 23, 24, and 25, and 31, well, let's do let's do these first. Um, if you want to hear an explanation of those, then let's hear a motion, and we'll. Fix it. Make motion. I second it. Okay, on articles 22, 23, 24, and 25. Is there a second? Yes. yes. Okay, those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, we're back in business. Okay. Thank you. Brian Hadlock, Parks and Recreation Commissioner. Uh, article 22, uh, just as a reminder to everyone, prior to the big budget cuts uh, in years past, Parks and Rec pretty much never put in many warrant articles ever. Um, it's very self-sufficient self on its budget. So what we now are putting in are maintenance items just to keep things maintained. Uh, the tennis court resurfacing is a regular scheduled thing that we do. Um, it gets stretched out longer than it used to, but basically this is to keep their tennis court servicing from going bad, similar to what people do with their parking lots. Uh, it also was redoing the striping, uh, it could be nets, could be the fencing, etc. Uh, Article 23, this is replacing the 18-year-old tractor. Um, I do want to address the select board because I was actually shocked at tonight's meeting to see that they voted against this 3-0 when for the last four years we've been coming to the public saying this tractor is dying on its way out. We're putting in have way too many repairs. No one had contacted us to even come and look at it to see the condition or the problems. We're sinking in between anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars a year for maintenance on this thing. Uh, Mike took it out this year to use it the first time and it went straight down and had another five thousand dollars of repairs put in. This is an, a, a piece of equipment that needs to be replaced. It is heavily used, and it is not a standard <coughs> piece of tractor that, you know, someone, a, a typical homeowner is going to have and be able to use. It's, it's 18 years old. Um, as everyone knows, Mike Spaulding maintains everything meticulously, and this was owned to Parks and Rec long before he got there. And we'll just leave it at that. Um, the pool roof repair replacement is the last of what we are doing other than the painting up of the pool for now. Uh, basically, there's one section of roof that is rotted uh, and needs to be replaced. <coughs> and timber harvesting. This article we had a problem with ourselves writing and Karen had to help us along with the state. Um, we actually don't know what the dollar amount is going to be from the timber harvesting from Mount Eustis. Uh, the timber harvesting has started, uh, the logs have been cut, they have not been <coughs> shipped away and I think that's just waiting until the prices are right. Um, and so we use, you can't say up to anymore. <coughs> so unfortunately we had to bump up the number because hey, if timber prices are that high maybe we'll get $25,000. The figures are of what we were quoted originally was anywhere from six to nine thousand, um, but we're hoping with the uh, increased uh, pricing coming from timber that uh, 
we'll get more. So I know uh, <coughs> Dan has a question. So. No, not a question. You, oh, okay. I'm just going to make a comment. Okay. So anybody else have any questions on Parks and Rec no. items? Thank you. And we appreciate your support. It's the 22, 23, 24, and 25. Let's deal with those. Let's go on the ballot. Um, are you speaking on one of those? Yes, okay. uh, on, on all of them, sort of. <coughs> I am uh, I'm recommending that all four not be passed. The first three, because Parks and Rec should be paying for itself. They should be charging the people who use it, not the taxpayers, uh, enough money to cover all their costs. The Article 25, the thing I have about that is that um, I don't want Park and Rec to have 25, uh, any money that they can spend without going through the taxpayer. I want the taxpayer to uh, approve or disapprove anything they want to spend. And if, if this goes to Park and Rec, that bypasses the taxpayer. Thank you. So, so. Now that they're on the floor, we can entertain a, uh, an amendment if people vote for it. I mean, are you making comments or a suggestion or a, an I'm motion? I'm just suggesting that people the, who are listening on the camera and everything uh, vote it down when they go to the polls. Vote no, but you're not change, you don't want to change anything here tonight. No. There's nothing I can change. I don't, I don't think you can. It's a warrant. It's a warrant. You, can't, you can't change the warrant. You can change the numbers. You can change the numbers. You can change the numbers. Oh, it's the numbers you can. You can change the numbers. Right. So, I mean, just just so that you know, you can change the dollar amount. Brian Hadlock again. Just to let everyone know, the parks commissioners are elected officials by the town people. Uh, any monies that are spent. Um, especially anything large, we are almost always working with the with Fred Moody and the Select Board, um, letting them know basically what we're doing before we do it. A lot of time, um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of money to spend. So no. Okay. All right. So. Dan. Dan. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> My apologies. That's okay. Mary Edick. Um, I believe all petitioned articles, having been signed by 25 voters, are to be put on the ballot, on the warrant. Yeah. I don't think we have to vote to put them on. Yeah. We, we vote. Oh, we agree with the amount they're asking, and we have the right to change the amount. Not petitioned articles. I think <laughs> <laughs> uh, which way is it going? The amount you can change. The amount can be amended, but the wording can't unless it's a spelling error. You can't change the intent, but, but you can the change the number. cannot be changed. You can change the, the amount, but amount not the intent. Okay. But we don't, well, okay, okay. But do, we do not have to vote to put them on. Well, with the, the implication is, you know, that Because you, they already are by petition. Does that make a distinction? Yeah, I, um, I can't answer that. Yeah, I no. think you're, you're agreeing to place them on the ballot as written. As written. Right. As written. Right. And that's what we're doing, right? Because we could change the amount. I think we're going to have to kind of get past that first vote a little bit because of the confusion. Of it. So um, we're asking well, they didn't right now. Know what they were voting for. That's not my fault. Article, <laughs> Article 22, 23, and 24, 25. Explanation, no changes, so that just for, for clarity's sake, be sure that we understand the vote here. I'll entertain a motion to place all of those articles on the warrant as presented. So right. Okay, was there a second? Second. Second. So all those in favor say aye. 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 There's no. No. So, so then uh, the next one that we had a request for was 31. I, I, up here, it's, it's 
speak about uh, Ryan mentioned that the um, Dan Ryan mentioned that the um, commissioners and the select board are kind of in on that but again I would hope that people would vote against it because it's the taxpayers who pay the money not the not the uh, Sure. Commissioners. So you, yeah, you're reiterating your point. That's good. So the next one we had a request for is for 31, and the person who wants to speak on 31 is Jane McKay, and she's with Northern Human Services, also known as White Mount Mental Health. Or both. Okay. So I need your. Uh, she's not a resident, so need she would need approval by the voters to speak. So. Moved and seconded. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those no. No. Jane? Article 31. Uh, well, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I actually was born and raised in Littleton and uh, moved back to the area after college in 1979. So although I'm not a registered voter, I'm very um, connected with Littleton. My parents lived here and um, I'm uh, very concerned what happens in Littleton. Uh, I've ob I obviously have also worked in Littleton for many years. Um, I appreciate this opportunity because it's difficult for social service organizations to have a forum to um, say anything because um, this is the only opportunity. So um, I, I think that's a problem because I feel like it's important for people in the community to understand what they're voting on in social services as well as for police cruisers. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to read you quickly. Um, I'll just read what I um, submitted to the town of Littleton in the director's report, which I'm not sure if that goes in the town um, report anymore because Littleton hasn't appropriated money in recent years. So um, this is what I wrote. Uh, the past year has been extremely challenging for community mental health. As the need for responsive and effective mental health and substance abuse treatment increases, the resources continue to shrink. Uh, one only has to open a newspaper or web browser or listen to the nightly news to realize that untreated mental illness can result not only in personal distress, physical illness, disruption of families, and loss of employment productivity, but also in loss of life most commonly through suicide, but also through homicide. Although we may feel insulated from this kind of, t the kind of terrible events that have happened in Newtown, Connecticut, and other communities across the country, Littleton is actually not immune. A strong mental health system available to everyone in the community is crucial to assure that people who are struggling receive help. Northern Human Services is proud to be the behavioral health safety net for our community. No other organization provides the kind of comprehensive 24-7 services that extend far beyond office-based counseling. These services include day and nighttime mental health evaluations at the local hospital emergency room, 24-7 telephone access to a psychiatrist, same-day treatment in crisis situations, <coughs> expert behavioral health response to local disasters in schools, municipalities, places of business, and home and community-based services. To continue to keep our communities safe and healthy, we need the support of our towns. In 2013, Northern Human Services, White Mountain Mental Health, provided services to 286 Littleton residents. Uh, the full cost of these services was $468,825.10. We're asking for less than 2% of that amount. Um, our request is for $9,696.12, which has been the same request we've asked for over 10 years. It was originally based on per capita. Uh, we're asking all of our towns to contribute, not just Littleton, and sadly Littleton's been the only town in our service area that has chosen not to contribute over the last several years. Um, I, I have a theory about this, and I think that when a voter comes to the polls, um, if they see that the budget committee has uh, not recommended, they're likely to vote no. So. Um, 
that's a problem. And I think also mental health services are, is, are far less well understood by most people than like health or home health. So it feels like something that happens to someone else. Um, or it feels like, oh, I don't want to pay for somebody else's marriage counseling. But the kind of services I'm talking about are not well people who are optionally deciding to come for a little uh, self-improvement. I'm talking about people who are very <laughs> ill and are a danger to our communities in some cases, although most people with mental illness are not a danger. But um, I think it's community money well spent, and I'm almost done, um, because not funding mental health increases costs for the community with police, with um, health care, with loss of productivity for employment, um, and in many other ways. So I really appreciate this opportunity to speak, and um, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, just, just a point on your point about the um, not being recommended. Yes. Uh, and for clarification, okay. also, also for the record. Uh -huh. That, that I've learned, means that the um, budget, budget Committee decided not to take a, a position and required language for, for stating that they're not taking a position is uh, what you see before you, which says not recommended by the Budget right. Committee. And they, they, right. I know Seal had told me that when I called to try to find the right way to right. present to the town that, um, it, that that was the situation, that the Budget Committee decided not to take a position. I think if I'm, uh, I guess I feel honestly, Budget Committee people, that it, you know, I feel like part of your responsibility is taking a position and is, give, is providing the voters with some um, stance. So. From okay. my point of view, I, I would rather have you take a position. Okay, so. thank you. You're welcome. Dan? Uh, okay, you're speaking on the same article. Okay. <coughs> I wrote a letter to Northern Human Services last year and never got a reply. I actually wrote a letter posted to each one of these uh, charitable organizations and never got a reply. Um, I actually tried to reply to that letter, but you didn't give me any place to reply. To. Yes, I, I, I gave you my, there was my name and address on there. I have a copy of it if you need it. Um, the reason I would not vote for any of these is that uh, if you take one person, for instance, Mother Teresa, she never uh, got the state involved. She never had the state with their guns go to people's houses and, and take their money from them. She went and she begged. She begged for alms. And she and whatever she got, she distributed to the poor. Uh, what what these charitable organizations are doing is they're asking the state to, if someone doesn't pay their taxes, the state will go to the house and they will evict them. And if they try to put up a fight, they will be caged or they will be killed. This is not the way of a charitable organization. Charitable organizations should ask for donations, not not uh, confiscate people's property. Okay. And that's speaking on Article 31. Anything else on Article 31? So, are you ready for the question on 31? And that's placing it on the warrant for the March 11th meeting as printed. So moved. <coughs> Is that second, second favor say aye? Aye. aye. No. no. Okay, that, that takes care of Article 31. So who else has to speak? Yeah. Carol, I, I misunderstood what was happening with okay. all the articles earlier. Really? Okay. Am I allowed to speak on Article 36? On Article 36, you, um, yeah, we kind of got past that. that uh, the social service articles. Uh, I mean, we got past the, uh, that's the very last one. Yeah, it was a misunderstanding. We'll go back to it, though. Go ahead on the article. Is it, am I allowed to yeah. speak now? Yeah. My name is Mel Brooks, and I'm speaking primarily because it's the only social service article that the selectmen voted not to recommend. 
I am not a board member of the board, Boys and Girls Club. I'm not an official. I'm just a concerned citizen. Littleton is fortunate that we have the Parks and Recreation uh, Department and the Boys and Girls Club to provide services for our children. The Parks and Recreation Department is not at all in means to every family and every child, and the Boys and Girls Club is not everything that has to be to every child and every family. But together, we are able to provide this service. I'm speaking for the Boys and Girls Club because the last few years I've been watching what they've been doing. I'm impressed with their the adult leadership, and especially their after-school program. Sixty Littleton students are enrolled in their after-school program. In the North Country, one out of every three students goes to an empty home after school. But in the Boys and Girls Club, they provide programs for these children. And they go throughout the day until 6 p.m. There are two programs that caught my eye. One was Power Hour. That's a time they take out and they do their homework. There's no negotiations. The kids do their homework and then they go on another, pro on another activity. Another activity that caught my mind during the after school program is they clean up time. After they do all their programs for the day, the kids clean up after themselves, which in today's society might be a novel idea. So these things are, are to me very important. Now, we have 60 children in Littleton who participate in the Boys and Girls Club program. The tax impact to support this war article is 17 cents per month for the average priced home in Littleton. <coughs> that means for 17 cents a month, 60 Littleton children have the use of the Boys and Girls Club month after month. And Gerald, 17 cents is peanuts. And I brought a prop to show you what that is. Gerald, this is 17 cents worth of peanuts. That's all it takes from each average homeowner to support these children is a handful of peanuts a month. But let me take it one step further. In this 17 cents worth of peanuts, there are approximately three dozen peanuts. But we have 60 children in this after school program. So that means that the cost per average household, per student, per month, is one half peanut. And I'm asking the selectmen to reconsider their vote and recommend this program. Gerald, Gerald I'm talking about peanuts, but we're really speaking about nurturing our children. Thank you. Dan, well, okay. What this still, gentleman still on, on thirty-six. Yes. What this gentleman uh, did not say, and what he would not tell the boys and girls of his club, is that he is using the state to take this peanut from people. He's he's not going and asking. He's not going to the house and saying, "Would you support us?" He's saying to the state, I want you to take you with your might and go to those people and take that money. He's not telling the boys and girls that that's what he's doing, but he is. Okay, out of 36. Yeah, yeah. When we considered this article and we voted against it, uh, and the vote was two to one, one selectman voted for it. Um, I wrote a, an email, and I'm only copying what I, what I wrote, to uh, one of the board members of the Boys and Girls Club. And I basically said, of the seven social service warrant articles, Article 36 was the only one asking for town assistance that offers services to a target population that already is available by the Parks and Rec Department, safe after school program, a town funded program. And I said basically that, um, both programs do a great job. We have 80 students 
that are registered. We treat about 30, or not treat, but we service about 30 to 35 every day, five days a week. We have an hour of homework as well, and we don't have, I don't know if we have cleanup, we may have cleanup, but we also have recreation activities that, that are provided. Our, our vote was simply one where we thought we were looking at a, a partially duplicated service. Um, a couple of years ago, the, the Parks and Rec Department lost its summer uh, adventure program for seventh and eighth graders during, you know, during the summertime, during the day. Um, because of the cuts that were made. And so I think we feel our obligation is to that program first. If, if there's only so many tax dollars, um, whether it's a petitioned article or whether it's a, a town article, um, the two of us felt that um, we, we needed to place our, place our eggs in that basket. And, uh, and it's not a, a hit on the Boys and Girls Club. But we do have a a top program that's very similar. Thank you. Okay. Article 36. I'm ready for the question on Article 36. Sylvie Smith. Um, that, that gentleman's point was well taken. However, this amount would, would stop a lot of people. If, if you were going to say $100 per child, drop, drop that amount, um, say even $6,000, people might be inclined to go for it, but it's just kind of a, it sticks in your craw in this economy at $10,000. Okay, is, uh, is that a comment or did you want to make an amendment? We, we would have to have an amendment. <coughs> Somebody to second it and discuss the amendment. Well, I need to have a motion first. Need it in writing. Need it in writing. I do need it in writing. Are you writing it up? Made, motion made and seconded. Discussion on the amendment. Amending the amount from ten thousand to six thousand is what my understanding. Is that right, Smith? That's correct. Okay. Uh, this uh, very same article for this same amount of money uh, passed last year, uh, so it was it was supported by the town taxpayers that came out and voted. Um, and and the I think the services provided by Boys and Girls Club and the Parks and Recreation are complementary, not competitive. The fact that even though there's a after school program available at Lakeway that services 30 kids, we still have 60 being bused down to the Boys and Girls Club. So the need is there and all the club is looking for is some financial support because 90% of their budget comes from donations and fundraisers. <laughs> One thing that Mr. Pratt forgot to mention in this uh, room over here, it's the history of the Boys and Girls Club and the history of the Park and Recreation. It's got to read something. Thank you. Somebody bring something to me? Yeah. Okay. So, we need to so on the floor is a, an amendment to Article 36 from uh, 10,000 to 6,000 that's been moved and seconded and discussed. Are you ready for that question? On the amendment. Yep. Okay, and the amendment is to change it from 10 to 6. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no? No. no. Okay, the no's have it. So are you ready for the other question? Yes. yes. <laughs> the question is uh, placing Article 36 on the warrant as uh, printed. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, article. No. <laughs> now, now, just for clarity, we skipped around on the articles. 
discuss some, and not others. I would entertain a motion, if you're ready, to place all remaining articles. On I want to talk on 33. Permission to speak on 33. 33. Unless somebody has an objection. Go ahead. I have a... Dan, I have a newspaper article here, and this has to do with uh, Tri-County Community Action Program. This is what I feel is not good stewardship. At the very bottom it says, a household does not need to recertify each year to remain eligible. That means that they don't know if that household has become millionaires or not, that household could keep recert they don't have to recertify. They just stay on it. And that is not good stewardship. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Article 33 has to do with the North Country Transit. It hasn't got to do with funding a it's not a separate revenue stream for Tri-County Cap. It's for Support. I, I don't care what that says. I'm looking at the article. All right. I'm saying to the people here, Mike, Mike, I'm saying to the people here that the newspaper article here says that they don't require households to recertify. That to me is not good stewardship, and that to me would be another reason not to vote for them. This has nothing to do with whether or not a family is certified for anything. What this does is the, the transportation system between Lancaster and Littleton and Whitefield. Okay? That's what it has to do with. And a number of people use it. They, they use it to get to work. They get to go shopping and things like that. That's what it's about. So whether or not you want to support it, that's one thing. But don't, don't mix these things, issues up. Okay, that's Article 30. John, will you speak on that? No? Okay. Article 33. Are you ready for the question on Article 33? Yes. Okay, and the question is, do you want to place Article 33 on the ballot March 11th as printed? All those in favor say aye. 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 No? No. Okay. The ayes have it. So, John? John Hesse. I'm not sure if this is a point of order or a motion, but I'd like to make a motion to lump all remaining articles together and to end discussion and to vote on them all at one time and put them on the ballot. Which the effect is that anything that's not been discussed will not be discussed and will be lumped and put on the ballot. All those in favor say aye. 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 No? No. Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Adjourn. Second. Meeting adjourned. Children. 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 Children.